Welcome to Biopics Mostly Suck, the podcast where we provide the true story behind movies based on a true story. Today, we're going to talk about the movie A Coal Miner's Daughter, a movie about the life of country music legend Loretta Lynn. The movie is directed by Michael Apted and stars Sissy Spacek as Loretta Lynn, Tommy Lee Jones as her husband Mooney, and Beverly D'Angelo as Patsy Cline. My guest for today's episode is my good friend Lolita. Oh, I've known Lolita for a very long time, and she recommended this film for today's episode. That's how it works. You recommend a film, you come on and talk about it. But other than liking Loretta Lynn and loving this movie, Lolita does something really spectacular. Lolita is a co-founder of a not-for-profit called Crossing Guardians. It's an organization that works to save and improve the lives of abused, neglected, and homeless animals suffering and struggling to survive along the California-Mexico border. They are an organization that is doing much-needed work, and in their work they need donations, and they need people in the San Diego area to be foster parents for animals, and Lolita is a foster parent herself for a few pups, and I, I think she even has one that has only one eye. Poor thing, but it's a good thing he has someone like Lolita in his life. Go ahead and check out their website at crossingguardians.org to see what you can do to donate or to foster an animal. A coal miner's daughter gets a 7.5 rating from the Internet Movie Database, an 87% rating from Metacritic, and an 86% fresh rating from Rotten Tomatoes. Sissy Spacek won awards for Best Actress during the awards season of 1981 from the National Board of Review, the Los Angeles Film Critics Society, the Golden Globes, and the Academy Awards. The movie A Coal Miner's Daughter took the Best Picture Prize from the same organizations. How is A Coal Miner's Daughter as a movie, and how is it as a medium to document the career of Loretta Lynn? Lolita and I will rate the movie as entertainment and as fact and give a grade at the end of the episode. If you're ready, let's get started. And if not, just hit pause. We'll still be here. Go ahead and speak into the microphone. Give me a sound check, please. Hello. One, two, three, testing. And so so I'm going to start by asking you, uh, why did you choose a coal miner's daughter? I chose it because back in 1980, I'm not really a country, western type of gal that listens to that type of music. I don't really, I mean, other than I I listen to some of them, like Patsy Cline. I love Patsy Cline. And uh, so I wasn't really interested when that movie came out. I heard about it. But one evening, she came out on a late night talk show. Um, I can't remember which one. And I hear in the background. And some of the things that she was saying was very interesting. Like they were asked her something about her husband having an affair. And she said, she said, uh, which one, the first one or the second one? And she was really funny. And because she was so funny, I thought, you know what? I bet you the movie is good. So I actually went to go see the movie, and I was really floored. It was not what I expected. So did you see the movie in the theater? Yes, I did. Oh, wow. So you saw it when it came out. When it came out. And I have always heard of a coal miner daughter, Mm -hmm. but I didn't really have an interest in seeing it. How come? I don't know. It's, you know, it's one of those things you're just always told it's good, but it never really reached an upper level of constantly being something that was there Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it's there's some things that you're always told are good it's like schindler's list i've never gotten around to see schindler's list List you know you know what we would say hey do we want to watch schindler's list this weekend and we go no no (laughs) no it's a good movie Uh, i understand it's a good movie but it's one of those things we never just got Uh to Coal Miner's Daughter didn't rise to that level. Okay. Where it was just in the consciousness. Yeah. It it would get mentioned award seasons or mentioned in an article about Mm -hmm. Sissy Spacek or Tommy Lee Jones. Both very good. And then just poof, it was gone and not to be thought of. When did you see it? Uh, Just 
a couple weeks ago. No. It, because we're doing this. What did you think of it? As a movie? Yeah. Let's talk about the plot first. Okay. Because that's how we do it. We talk about the plot of the movie. Sure. Then we're going to talk about our impressions of the film. And then we're going to give it a grade for entertainment between one and four stars. All right. Fair enough. And then we're going to talk about the true story behind this movie based on a true story. Okay. And we're going to give it a letter grade between A and F for accuracy. Okay. But let's go ahead and share with everyone what we're talking about in the plot. Because picture it. The year is 1945 and 13-year-old Loretta Webb is one of eight children of Ted Webb. He would be the coal miner Mm -hmm. in the title, who she's a daughter of. He and his wife are raising their children in poverty in Butcher Holler, Kentucky. At the age of 13, Loretta marries Oliver Mooney Lynn, a.k.a. Do or Doolittle, and quickly becomes pregnant with their first child. Mooney wants to leave the holler because he knows the toll that working in the mines will take on his health. He seeks opportunity in the logging industry in Washington State and sends for Loretta to join him. There is really a nicely done piece in Washington, in the kitchen, where her children come in one by one Mm -hmm. in successive age. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a clever way to show a passing of time. Right. Whatever you can see the time. years, right. Exactly. That they've been there. Yes. Yeah. And it was so much better than putting up, you know, a font that just said what year it was. Exactly. Or how many years have passed. Exactly. And I haven't seen that done before or since, but I thought that was such a clever mm-hmm. way to show the passage of time. Loretta sings around the house and Mooney gets her a guitar from a pawn shop as an anniversary present. She teaches herself to play. And she writes songs, and Mooney arranges for her to go on stage at a local community get-together. Norm Burley of Zero Records hears her sing and gives Moon and Loretta the money to make a demo tape that will become Loretta's first single, I'm a Honky Tonk Girl. After the single is cut, Mooney pushes for them to promote the single. He stays up late at night writing letters to radio station managers and stuffing the envelopes with a 45 RPM single. I really like that part, Rob, because it showed how he was driven to make her a success because he knew her talent. And at that time, he was the only one that knew she was talented because she would only sing at home to her kids. Mm -hmm. So it was just amazing when I saw that. Yeah, and and I always wondered because when you watch the movie, you realize... Mm -hmm. None of this would have happened for her. That's right. Would not have been for him pushing it. Mm -hmm. And and I wonder, I wonder if that came always from a good place. Do you know what I mean? Or did it come from a controlling aspect in any way? Well, he was controlling. Yes. There were some scenes where he would be very tender with her. Mm -hmm. He would compliment her because he did a lot of criticizing. You know, she was very young when they got together. But when it came to her singing, he always complimented her in a very tender way where, you know, it's believable. And I believe that he believed that. In her talent, you mean? In her talent. Yeah. Again, she only sang at home. You know, she was bashful. She didn't want to sing anywhere else. So, you know, that's where she felt free that she can sing, especially to her children. And he would hear it. And I really believe that he knew that that was talent. Loretta's father dies in Kentucky, and Loretta and Mooney travel from radio station to radio station to follow up on the letter and single that were sent and to make appearances. Unbeknownst to them, I'm a Honky Tonk Girl has climbed up the charts and has grown in jukebox plays. This film really has some good humor in it, too, Mm -hmm. because I do love the part when they're in the radio station and the station manager says he's not going to fall for the hillbilly bit. <laughs> and, and you remember what Moon yes. says? Yeah. Oh, believe me, if you knew Loretta, this isn't an act or it's something like act. that. Yeah, it wasn't an act or something. Yeah, it was a. <laughs> and what I think is really comic there is her response because she just looks at Moon and says, "Thank you, do." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah, she's she's thank you, dude. <laughs> yes, that was really funny. Yeah. 
1961, Loretta earns a spot on the Grand Old Opry. After 17 straight performances on the Grand Old Opry, Loretta is invited to play at Ernest Tubb Record Shop's Midnight Jamboree. Loretta does a cover version of Patsy Cline's I Fall to Pieces because Cline has been in a near-fatal car accident and was recovering in the hospital. Cline's husband, Charlie Dick, goes to Ernest Tubbs' record shop to bring Loretta to Cline. They form a fast friendship, and Cline becomes a mentor to Lynn. That, to me, I found very interesting. I, I have always loved Patsy Cline. I didn't really know about her life, but because of this movie, I actually became interested in Patsy Cline's life. I didn't know they were really good friends. In fact, you know, she was her mentor. Mm -hmm. She's the one who showed her the ropes. It, and Beverly D'Angelo plays oh. this role in just such an amazing way because from the first moment when they meet, you as a viewer want to be Patsy Cline's mm -hmm. friend. She is so disarming when she says, haven't you seen the popular music star uh, right. before, you know, a right. glamorous star or something yeah. like that? And she starts laughing. Yeah. She's almost antithetical to Loretta Lynn because mm -hmm. she is in control. She even refers to her husband as a tax deduction. Yeah. And when Loretta Lynn tries that on Mooney. It didn't go. He, he, well. doesn't, he doesn't take it too well. No. But you can see the mentorship that's developing yeah. and you can see Loretta starting to follow Patsy Cline. Oh, yeah. Down to the makeup she used. Yes. Patsy Cline was such an influence on her, and it was, uh, and Beverly D'Angelo played that role really, really well. Yeah, and that was her singing. Yes, it's a beautiful voice. Yeah, well, so that was Sissy Spacek as well. But boy, when Beverly D'Angelo sang, it's really, really, you know, good. She did. She played Patsy Cline so well. Have you ever seen Sweet Dreams with well, Jessica Lange? Yes, I did. Yes, I have. I haven't seen that yet. How yeah, is it? Very good. It was a very, very, very good movie because I like Patsy Cline. But she did well. She did very good, too. She was a good a good Patsy Cline. And isn't that Ed Harris? Yes, it is. It too? I forgot about that. Yeah. Ed Harris did play her husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, yeah, you have to see the movie, Rob, because it's, yeah, you learn about her life. Well, maybe we should come back and do an episode. I love it because, like I said, I'm a Patsy Cline fan. All right. Yeah. We have our next episode planned. Sounds good. While touring and trying to keep her marriage and family together, Lynn has a nervous breakdown on stage during the concert. She takes time off on her ranch and is back on the road a year later, and now known as the First Lady of Country Music. And the film closes with Sissy Spacek as Loretta Lynn performing her autobiographical song, A Coal Miner's Daughter. And that's one thing that I thought was interesting is... When they hit the mental breakdown piece, mm -hmm. I think I'm used to biopics making that the focus of oh. the narrative. And the only thing they had regarding her mental breakdown was what happened on stage. And then there were a few shots of her just at the ranch. Right. But they didn't delve into any type of recovery. And I think I've become so accustomed to it in biopics that have come since A Coal Miner's Daughter mm -hmm. that at first I'm thinking, okay, well, they kind of cheated out of that. And then I immediately thought, but do we need to see all of that? Do you think Loretta Lynn didn't want to focus on her, on her breakdown? This is why it was just, it was so short. It wasn't that long. It wasn't a prolonged scene as to why it happened, no. what developed it. This is what happened after she had the mental breakdown. It was she started having these headaches. Um, you could tell she was getting tired. Um, you could tell she was under a lot of pressure with her fans. But there's always a, a stigma when someone has a, a mental yeah. breakdown. And uh, you know, it could be old school. You know, back then it wasn't good to, to have breakdowns. Mm -hmm. I mean, she tried to be strong. So I'm wondering if that's why in the movie it was very limited. You know, you may be right. It may be how mental illness was perceived at the time. It was yeah. There's yeah. a very different perception of mental illness today than it was. This movie's over 25 years old. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that's the reason why they kept that 
part of the movie very short. That I, I think that would probably be it because she was very honest about other things. Everything. I mean, from the physical violence, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, her not wanting to have her twins. Yeah. You know, so everything was very open except for that one part at the end when she had a breakdown. We're just kind of breezed over it. Very, and, very much And then so. she was back on the road. Right, right. Or maybe she just wanted to end it on a happy note instead of just belaboring on her breakdown. Yeah. Now, I do think this film did a greater job at capturing the toll the road takes on a performer yeah. more than any other film. Yes. In that there is so much of yourself you have to put out there and mm -hmm. so much of you that gets taken. Mm -hmm. And especially that part where the woman grabs part of her hair. Yeah. It did a real great job of detailing what the breakdowns are. Right. Because again, I think I've just been become conditioned to other biopics where it's alcohol or drugs or some other type of substance that is being used in order to cope with it. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't in Loretta Lynn's story. No. So that toll of the road, it really, it's what caused the mental breakdown. Right. I think it's what was expected of her became mm -hmm. too much, you know, just trying to please the fans. Um, I think in a way trying to still please Mooney, you know, that, that she can do it, that she's doing this for him. Yeah. And I think, I think by and large, I don't think the public views being a performer, whether it's on film or whether it's on stage, as being a job. Right. You, you get to sing your music. Yeah. You get to do what you want right. to do. And, and then what problems do you have? Mm -hmm. Because I have to go to an office and it's not my first choice. Right. But you get to do what you want to do. But there's always bullshit and politics that come into it. Yeah. No matter what your job is or no matter how much you enjoy a creative process, there's still elements of it being a job that are going to be a downside. Right. But they don't see that. They say, oh, you get to do what you love to do. Mm -hmm. um, they don't see the long hours on the road, the being away from their family. Yeah. Um, did you see her sleeping? I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't think I can sleep on a bus very comfortably. No. No. They don't see that. They just see her perform. She's putting on this act. She is singing, and which is what she loves to do. But there's a lot involved in all oh, yeah. that. And I don't think fans, you know, the fans want her to make them happy. But they're not thinking about her needs or yeah. anything. But, you know, that's life in the entertainment industry. But it's hard. Yeah. You know? and I thought this movie did a real outstanding job of showing just what can happen to a person when they end up getting beat down by it. Right. It's something you really have to learn to manage. And mm -hmm. like, like a lot of other things involving jobs. Right. You have to learn right. to manage different aspects. Exactly. Of it. You have yeah. to change. And let's not forget to mention that right after she had the twins, she said she wanted to go back on the road, Yep. you know, so she can uh, stay up there. Yeah. You know, and that's another reason why I think she kept pushing herself is she wanted to make sure she was still, she was remembered. What did you think about her picking up music? I mean, she was obviously musically inclined. I mean, all she did was sing. You could tell that she, you know, when she would sing and hum, but the fact that she would um, just pick up a guitar, mm -hmm. you know, or she calls it a guitar. 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 Why'd you buy me a guitar? And I just picked it up, and it was that scene where Mooney says, well, if you don't want it, I'll just smash it. And she goes, no. And she took it, and you could tell she was strumming on it. But, I mean, what do you think about her? Just the fact that she and wrote music. I thought it was amazing. Remember, she wasn't educated. No, she was self-taught on everything. She was self-taught on everything, yeah. right. That scene where she was cutting her first record, Mm -hmm. And he goes, can you show me a C? And she would lift up the guitar. Uh -huh. She didn't know what it was. She was going. Because I think she said there ain't but three chords. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the scene you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But... And she would play them. You know, blah, blah, blah. She, she would actually just play the three uh -huh. simple chords. But she did not know what the chords were. No, I mean, it's just fantastic. And some people can do that. Some people just have that in them to be yeah. able to teach themselves and pick it all up and start going. I mean, I play guitar, but I star in my own living room. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I, 
<laughs> and I haven't learned properly, so I don't know how to play with people. Uh, yeah. I got a friend who will play accompaniment, but yeah, if I were to get together with people and play, I just end up feeling so out of my depth. Right. Right. Yeah. And she was able to pick it up yeah. because they said, oh, you know, let me, let's get other, you know, like better pickers, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but she was able to join in without any problems. Yeah. And to me, like you said, it's self-taught, which is something that I wish I always had because I love music, mm -hmm. but I don't have that. Yeah. Um, my brother does. It's very good, but I don't have it. And, um, I just think it's just a talent that amazes me still. It's like someone picking up, just picking up a second language. Yeah. It's to me, music is a different language. And for you to pick for someone like that to pick it up. And again, she was not an educated person. Very simple. That's, that's a good word. She was a very simple person. By the way, do you know who's playing the uh, music engineer in that scene? No, who? Mooney. No. Which means when Tommy Lee Jones is talking to the record engineer, he's in a conversation with the same guy who he's playing. Are you serious? I'm serious. That I didn't was, even pick it up. That was Mooney. Oh, that is... <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh -huh. yeah. I didn't... Wow. Uh, apparently, they wound up becoming very good friends, even though Mooney didn't like him at first. He... I did... Now, that I didn't know. Why? He just, he didn't like the idea of this guy from Hollywood portraying him. He played him so well. And then when they started to bond, remember when Tommy Lee Jones is driving the bulldozer? Yeah. Mooney had to teach him how to drive that bulldozer. Oh. And that's when they kind of started to click together. I didn't know he didn't like him. Not initially. Now, Loretta Lynn and Sissy Spacek, on the other hand, Loretta Lynn had already decided that's who's going to play her. Oh, she was a perfect pick. She was given a stack of photographs and chose Sissy Spacek out of that. Just because she liked her? Yeah, just, just based on looks first. Wow. She said, that's the girl. And then Sissy Spacek was debating on whether or not she's going to take the role. And Loretta Lynn was on one of the late night talk shows. And announced that Sissy Spacek was going to play before her. she even accepted before the she role? even accepted it. No. So Loretta Lynn kind of pushed her into it, and then Sissy Spacek said that her mother said, "Well, you should pray on it." And Sissy Spacek was in the car, and a Loretta Lynn song came on, and she said, "Okay." She... And, and that was her singing, and that was her playing the guitar, yeah. and. But she also followed Loretta Lynn on tour to watch her backstage. Oh, wow. And then Loretta Lynn has said, and this is on the 25th anniversary DVD, Loretta Lynn said that they went into a recording booth together and they would trade off lines of singing wow. songs. And then she would take that tape and she would play it for friends. And she would say, okay, tell me who's me. Are you serious? Tell me which line is no me. No kidding. And her friends weren't able to. Well, Loretta Lynn probably knew something. A little side note about Loretta Lynn, um, and it kind of touches upon it in the movie where, um, you know, she has the sixth sense mm -hmm. when her father, you know, when they were calling Loretta, Loretta, and then um, their neighbor was coming over and she said she saw her dad. She's always said that she had this, like a sixth sense. She even went back to the funeral and she says, he came to me, hmm. you know, her dad came to her. Wow. And, and I think, well, maybe that's how she felt when she saw Sissy Spacek and uh, with all the photos, she probably thought she can play me. Right. There's just something about her, yeah. you know, that, but she perfect pick because yeah. you're right. I can't tell the difference. No. But when, she, when Sissy Spacek singing or when Loretta Lynn is singing. And I wondered that. At first, I thought, because she sounds so much like her, I thought she was lip syncing it, mm -hmm. but she wasn't. That was actually her. I mean, if you see her strumming the guitar, yep. that's her playing, yeah. you know, and that had to have been her singing. She was the perfect actress or actor to play her. Yeah. And so was, so was Tommy Lee uh, Jones. He's great as Mooney. In fact, sometimes I thought that is actually him. And, and with Mooney, they really went light on his infidelities. Yeah. He cheated on her a lot more. Yes. Than what's shown yes. in the movie. You know, when she would travel, he would have women 
in their house. I, don't know, I read. And then um, people would ask. Wait, with, with the girls there? With the daughters there? Well, yeah, he'd have, you know, if they, they didn't say, they just said that as she's traveling, she, he would have women at their house. Shame. Speaking of the kids, that was one thing in the movie that I didn't get. I got when they were going to the radio station, she said her mother was watching the four kids yeah. they had already. Mm -hmm. And then they had the twins and the four kids never showed up again. No, just the fact that her son, Jack, mm -hmm. got in a car accident. When she came back from one of the tours, she saw one of his race cars and was all like it got in an accident. Oh. So they had mentioned it. They had mentioned, but they were grown up. Oh, they were grown by the Believe time. it or not, when her twins were born, she was already a grandmother. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. She was already a grandmother. Yeah. They didn't mention that in the movie at no. all? No. No. You know, one thing I read about this movie that I found really interesting was uh, the the structure of the film and the use of light. Because if you follow mm. what happens in the movie, in Butcher Holler, it's dark. Very dark. A and then what's next? Washington, where it's rainy, but there, it's a little more light. And then what's the next scene after that? They're back in Butcher Holler, but then it's them on the plains in the sunshine, yeah. going radio station to radio station, and then the spotlight. Well, so there's this transition of light that takes place throughout the film. You're right. But it also, if you think about it, it's also different periods of season. You know, oh, they, yes. Yeah, it seems like it was more like summer when they went traveling, trying to find the the station, this transmitter, and it was it was warmer, whereas... It, the beginning of the scene that was cold winter yeah just like <laughs> the honeymoon scene and she goes it's so cold <laughs> she wouldn't want to get out she didn't want to take her clothes off yeah but as things were improving it the film gets lighter yeah you're right the first time i noticed that was when she was in the kitchen cooking dinner and all her kids were around her mm -hmm. i mean it's like there was a lot of light it wasn't dark like her home in butcher holler yeah it was really bright, and then her husband came home, and yeah, you're right. Good call. A lot of real locations from Loretta Lynn's life mm -hmm. were used. The Grand Old Opry scenes were filmed in the Ryman Auditorium, which is where the Grand Old Opry was at that time, time. before it moved. And there's also people who were involved in Loretta Lynn's story who portray themselves in the film. Ernest Tubb Tub. is really Ernest Tubb. Mm -hmm. You see Minnie Pearl there, mm -hmm. who, uh, I don't know if anyone would know her from Hee Haw. What, what would the age break be for that? Because I remember Hee Haw. I remember Hee Haw. It's so weird you should say that, because I had mentioned, do you remember the show Hee Haw? And half the people laughed, and half the people said no. They didn't know about Roy Clark popping out Roy Clark, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. Minnie Pearl wearing uh, your little uh, hat with a little yeah. tag on it. No, and I said, you never heard of Hee Haw? And they said no. And it just occurred to me talking about hee-haw. Wasn't it really just a country laughing? Yes. Basically, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> laughing. No, yeah. do you remember laughing? I remember laughing. And I mean, I watched it. I think I was Goldie. too I was too young for laughing. Okay. I was going to say, I think you're too young. Because I remember like Goldie Hawn. Oh, yeah. When she was on there. And R.D. Johnson. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And Steve Martin was a writer. Oh, I did not know yeah. that. He was... A, he was I'm going to have to check that. That may have to be a fact check I do after we talk. Okay. I know he wrote for the Smothers Brothers. Yes. I want to say he wrote for Laughing too, but I'll have to check that out. So we had a lot of real people from Loretta Lynn's life who showed up in the movie. And I mentioned the real Mooney was the record producer. Yeah. There I, I, I got to go back and check. I have to check it out. I really do have to check it out. I had no idea. So I want to thank you for recommending this movie because otherwise I wouldn't have seen it. And after I saw it, my first thought was, you know, there's a reason why this is really mentioned as a biopic. In fact, when What's Love Got to Do With It came out, mm. a lot of reviews said it was the best biopic since A Coal Miner's Daughter. Wow. And I, th I think this movie, A Coal Miner's Daughter, well, number one, I think it set the template for other biopics mm -hmm. to follow. Number two, it did not fall into the same tropes 
that we've come to expect from a biopic. Yeah. And number three, the people of Appalachia were treated very respectfully, mm -hmm. very fairly. It didn't fall into hillbilly stereotypes. Right. And you're right. That's a that's a good perspective. They they were more came as a hard working class community actually, because yeah. all they were were coal miners. So, well, what did you think when I recommended? Okay, I'll watch this. Really? You <laughs> yeah. didn't want to? No. <laughs> like I said, it wasn't at the top of my list in any way. Yeah. And I really really enjoyed it. So thank you for recommending. Yeah, this movie. you're welcome. One to four stars. What would you give it as a movie? As a movie, I would give it a three. A three, not a, three. a four? Well, no, let me let me do a perspective. Okay. Why it's okay. Okay. Um, because it was made in the eighties. Okay, I've seen many movies after that. And it was very it was a very simple, simply made movie. And I say three because technology wasn't like it is now. Now you watch any type of biographical movie or autobiographical movies. There's um, better lighting. So as as far as that aspect is concerned, that's why it's a three. But overall, the storyline, the story itself, I would give it a four. Okay. So maybe a 3.5. And I'll go 3.5 as well. Mm -hmm. I think that as a biopic, it's just fantastic. Yeah. I didn't walk away with thinking about the problems I have seen in other biopics. Mm -hmm. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much for recommending this. Oh, yeah. It was great. In this portion of the podcast, we're going to talk about how facts were presented in the film and the historical and factual accuracy of each item. At the end of the discussion, we're going to give the film a letter grade of A through F for truthfulness. So let's go ahead and get started. And what we're going to start discussing first, Lolita, is... This part of the movie where Loretta Webb marries Oliver Mooney Lynn when she is 13 in Kentucky and mm. has four children by the age of 19. That's what was presented in the movie. And the first thing I thought when I watched the movie was, would that even be legal? You're absolutely right. It would not be legal. In Kentucky. Yeah. So I did some research on it. Loretta Lynn wrote in her autobiography that she married Mooney when she was 13. Mm -hmm. So this comes straight out of the autobiography. And he was 21. Also, Lynn wrote in her autobiography, when I was born, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the president for several years. That's the closest I'm going to come to telling my age in this book. So don't go looking for it. <laughs> I'm trying to make a living singing songs. I don't need nobody out there saying... She don't look bad considering she's such and such years old. <laughs> in addition, Kentucky had the most lax marriage laws in the country until 2018. Before then, the minimum age of marriage was 16. If the girl was pregnant, an exception was granted with no minimum age restriction. Wow. Unchained at last, the only nonprofit agency working to end child marriage has found that only 14% of child marriages between 2000 and 2010 were children marrying each other. In 60% of the cases, the other person reported to be between the ages of 18 and 20, less than 3% of marriage reported an age of over 29 years old. In 400 cases, the adult was over the age of 40. And in 31 cases, the adult was over the age of 60, hmm. marrying a minor. When Loretta and Oliver were married, if she was 13 and he was 21, the marriage would have been illegal because she was not pregnant at the time of the marriage. Since Lynn's autobiography was released, some historical records have been found. In the 1940 census, Ted Webb reports that Loretta is seven years old. An Associated Press reporter found Lynn's birth certificate online, and it shows that her date of birth is April 14, 1932, and this date also appears on her marriage license and two affidavits from Lynn's mother. Right. The Johnson County Clerk's Office listed Lynn as 15 on January 10, 1948, which means she was just shy of her 16th birthday, which was a common age for marriage to happen to someone who was an adult. 
And that is where parental consent would come in. And that was shown in the movie. Right. When the, when the preacher asks, who gives this woman away? And Levon Helm, as her father, says, I do. So there was the parental consent right there. Right. How awesome was he in this? Oh, he was so awesome. Because you know he's in the band or was in the band. No. You know the band, the band? Oh, the band, the band. Yeah, yeah, I'm the sorry. The band, was, the band that yeah. played with Bob Dylan yeah. and did The Wait, one of the no, best songs of all yes. time? Yes. That's him. Yes. No. Yes. He was so fantastic. I think that was his first film role because he was a friend of Tommy Lee Jones. And that's why? That's why he got, he got in, yes. Because the director said, I really can't find someone who can play this role of Loretta Lynn's father. And Tommy Lee Jones talked to his friend Levon Hill. Has he ever acted before? He acted plenty after that, but this was but his first. This, this was his first this, acting this role? This was his first. I would have never known it. No. I mean, you saw the disappointment in his face, the mm -hmm. sadness in his face, the anger in his face. I mean, and and for someone that has never acted, wow. No, he Talk was... Talk about being naturally talented. He was fantastic. Wow. So let's get back to talking about Loretta Lynn's age because yeah. there's a little more information here. When the Associated Press contacted Lynn's spokeswoman, Nancy Russell of Nashville, Tennessee, she declined to comment on Lynn's age. She said Lynn had told her before in no uncertain terms, if anyone asks how old I am, tell them it's none of their mm -hmm. business. Other than Lynn fudging her age in her autobiography, the movie really doesn't take other liberties with her life. Mooney really was the driving force between everything that happened to her. He really had to come to terms with his role now that he pushed Loretta Lynn into music and she became a star. I don't know how much he anticipated what changes that would bring for him. So let me ask you about that. Do you think he had a problem with her becoming popular you know, recognizing that she's a star, or do you think he had a problem with her becoming independent? She was very dependent on him. Mm -hmm. Remember, she's very young. Yeah. You know, whether she says 13 or whether it was she was almost 16, either way, that's still young. Yeah. And he had a lifetime. He was in the military. Mm -hmm. Do you think Mooney had a problem with her actually becoming independent or because she was actually, you know, because of the music? I mean, he got her into it. He did, but I think this was a be careful for what you wish for situation. Yeah, that's what, that's, I he, think that as well. Because he saw her talent, he pushed her into performing. I don't think he ever anticipated what that would mean for him. Right. He may have thought he would benefit from it. I don't think he ever anticipated that when it comes to traditional gender roles, that it would make a stark change for him. Right. I think... If he was cheating anyway, that's a separate boatload of problems. Right. He's got doing that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's triggered by this. Right. But he, uh, but yeah, I mean, what the movie shows of him having to transition, which I thought Tommy Lee Jones played beautifully mm -hmm. because he had to take care of the girls and then he transitioned to taking care of the ranch and his role changed. His role, his role did not become a a traditional male head of household role right she was the head of the household and he was supporting her and no doubt he probably had problems with that mm -hmm. given that you know the upbringing in appalachia and uh just to mean that you know very gendered roles are traditional right and i think that scene where Patsy Klein said he's nothing but a tax deduction mm -hmm. and, and, and Loretta Lynn, and that goes for you. I think that really emasculated him. Well, and you know, Patsy Klein's husband and Mooney, they were both good friends. They were very close friends. But the way the movie presents Charlie Dick, he obviously took it a lot better than Mooney did. You have to see Patsy Klein. Okay. I, I, you mean Sweet Dreams? Yeah. You have to see the movie about Patsy Klein. Because when see. she made that comment about him being a tax deduction, mm -hmm. he seemed to laugh it off like he's in on the joke that he was enjoying yeah. what his role was. Yeah. 
did Sweet Dreams show that as well, or does Sweet Dreams show it? Differently? They had problems. They had problems. Oh, they okay. had problems. Yeah, they really did. It's it's not. When I saw that, I went, "Oh, it seemed kind of subdued." Um, when she said that to him, but if you see the movie see Sweet Dreams, which I think really you should, okay. okay and, we, and like you said, we'll we'll, we'll do this. Uh, you'll see, it's different. I agree with you. I think gender role reverse. He didn't have to manage her anymore. No. Um, she became very independent. So you're right. I don't think he anticipated what came with all this. Mm-hmm. I think he says, oh, well, well, you know, he wanted her sing. Number one, he thought she was a very good singer. But two, he wanted to make money. Yeah. Wanted to better their lives. Mm-hmm. And this is the way to do it. But I don't think he thought how, how this was going to impact his life, not impact her life. It's his life that's going to be impacted. Now, there's a sequence in the movie, the one where they're going from radio station to radio station, which seems to be just tailor-made for a biopic. Mm -hmm. It it just seems like really stock biopic type of stuff, including Mm -hmm. them not realizing that they were on the charts. Right. But that's all true. Like number 14. Yeah, number 14 14 on the charts. That is absolutely true. That's how they found out, was at a radio station as they were going from radio station to radio station. We also talked about what was shown of the mental breakdown. Mm-hmm. And we also talked about Mooney's infidelities not fully being shown, but I think that's a quibble. I, I don't yeah. really think that has anything to do with the veracity or the truth of the film. Right. In any way, it's just the level to which they decided to delve into those particular topics. Right, right. Although, you know, people question why she stayed with him, knowing that he always cheated on her. And she said, because they do love each other. Well, she also said there isn't one time he hit me once that I didn't hit him back twice. Oh, she she says she gave as much as he. Yeah. You know, she said if he hit me, I'd hit him twice. I, I, I read an article where she hit him so hard that she knocked his <laughs> two front teeth. <laughs> and she says she hurt. It hit the floor. And she went, oh, <laughs> she, she said she knew she was in trouble. And she was, you know, and he laughed about it. And he didn't get it replaced until she started making, you know, more money. But, yeah, she used to hit back. Their relationship was very tumultuous. The thing is, they actually loved each other. She really loved him. Yeah, she really loved him. He was really a support. But I have a hard time reconciling Loretta Lynn a little bit as well. Because it's not out there because of salacious intent. It's out there because she published it. Mm-hmm. She, of course. She, she made all of this known. Yeah. But at the same time, she was also singing songs about women not putting up with that behavior. Yeah. Don't Come Home a Drinking with Lovin' on Your Mind is a great song. Right. The Pill. Have you ever heard The Pill? No, I have not. Oh, my God. The Pill is great. I'll have to play it. I'll go yeah. ahead and make the YouTube available on the website at biopicsmostlysuck.com slash a coal miner's daughter. But The Pill is all about, you know, I've been cranking out babies and this isn't going to happen anymore because I've got the pill. Wow. So she was very, very progressive in the songs she wrote, but it seems a lot of times she didn't quite live that. So I have a hard time reconciling. I see what you're saying. All her music, really, they said, was based on her relationship with her husband. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than the coal miner daughters. But if you think about like that song, uh, You Ain't Man Enough, yeah. It, yeah. Just, that was funny. And she says it's it's based on her relationship. Still, she, here she's writing music about him cheating and all that mm-hmm. stuff. They asked her, why do you stay with him? And she said, well, if your man is not worth fighting for, he's not worth keeping or something mm-hmm. like that. Of course, I'm, I'm misquoting it, but something to that effect. And I thought, wow. Yeah. But you're right. I, I'm finding it hard to reconcile her staying with him. I mean, the yeah. violence, the cheating, and she knows it. She knows it's it's more like, oh, there's, there's do again cheating, but not really thinking what it's actually doing to her. That's... But for the movie, Lolita, letter grade A through F for truthfulness, what would you say? I would say, compared to all the movies I've seen, like uh-huh. I said, I, I would say this is close to the truth. I would give it, I'd give it an A. You know, I was thinking the same thing. I think you've given us our first A letter grade yes, for a yes. film for Truth of Us. Yes, it's what I recommended to you. Woo-hoo. And we talked about how good of a film it is. Yes. And, and yeah. one thing we've always talked about here is you can make a great biopic 
and have it honed close to the truth. I mean, yes. I've, I've always said with Bohemian Rhapsody, would have been awful to have a film about four guys who got together and made great music. Right. You know, instead of creating the bullshit they created with Freddie Mercury and him being a lot of it wasn't true no i re I listened to your your podcast on that and it's like so true what you guys were saying it's, it's i i watched it and then i thought but this isn't really happening this isn't happen it, huh. it was out of it was out of context it was out of time i mean even the timelines were off and i thought did you really have to do that just to get people to watch the movie yeah and here we have a film that's over 25 let's say came out in 1980 right mm -hmm. And we're in 2020. Oh, my God, yeah. So what are we at here? A higher math. Huh. That's... 40? Is... About 40 years. About 40 yeah, years. Yeah, about 40 years. Yeah. We have a 40-year-old film, which, other than her fudge and her age, is true from... Because mm -hmm. I couldn't find anything else, literally. Uh, no. Usually when I Google name of movie, fact versus fiction, I find all kinds of stuff. Right. I searched and searched and searched. Couldn't find anything. Other couldn't than find the anything thing. either. Yeah, that was it. And yeah, because I know you. You kind of gave me heads up that we were going to go to the you know, fact or fiction. Mm -hmm. I could not find anything other than. I mean, the most controversy thing I found was her age. Yeah. But back then they didn't keep records very well. No. You know, and what difference does it make? Thirteen, sixteen. I know it's three years, but you're still a child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're still a child, so also lowering her age makes Mooney look worse. I know. It's, it's yeah, kind of creeper just, territory. It is kind of creepy. You know, mm. I thought about it, I went, You'd be arrested now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know. Yeah, but it did. It kind of made him creepy. If it were 13. So for truthfulness, we have an A letter grade from me, an A letter hey, grade from Lolita, yes. and uh, our first A letter grade of the of the series. Yay. Yay. Lolita, thank you for doing this. This I was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. It's my first one, and I really, it, I loved it. Thank you for inviting me and asking me to do this podcast with you. It's Absolutely. my pleasure. Good to have you. All right. Thanks. Uh -huh. I love it. Now it's time for us to fact check ourselves. We come to these conversations prepared, but sometimes we find ourselves going in a direction we weren't prepared for, or we mention some bad information, or we just completely make stuff up. For instance, I am a huge fan of Steve Martin, but I got it wrong when I said he wrote for Laughing. Martin's first job writing for television was the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, but he also worked on the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour and the Sonny and Cher Show. But he did not work on Laughing. That wraps up another episode of Biopics Mostly Suck. If you liked it, please subscribe using your favorite podcasting platform. We are literally everywhere, but not Spreaker. You can find all of the resources we use to build this episode at biopicsmostlysuck.com slash a coal miner's daughter. I usually throw some other goodies on the episode pages like videos or pictures. And for a coal miner's daughter, I have that song, The Pill, that Lolita and I talked about in the episode. That's there for you to listen to. And since Lolita and I also talked about the show Hee Haw, I have found the first episode of Hee Haw for your enjoyment. The first episode had Loretta Lynn as a guest, and it also had country legend Charlie Pride. I want to thank Lolita for recommending a coal miner's daughter and for joining me to discuss the movie. Remember, you can find information about Crossing Guardians at crossingguardians.org. Go take a look at how you can support this organization who is doing great work to save stray animals in the border area of San Diego. How are we doing on this project? Go like us on Facebook and Twitter at the handle of at Mostly Suck, or send us your feedback through our website, biopicsmostlysuck.com, and you can recommend which movies you would like us to use for an episode, and we will share the true story behind that movie based on a true story. Take care, everyone. <laughs>